I encouraged all of you in my sermon last week that when life seems unfair, you should lean on the Lord because God having all power and all authority, God will make crooked places straight. Yet someone will think someone will ask, why should I lean on the Lord? Why should I lean on God? What will he do for me? There is this idea that as life is unfair, God is also unfair. There are many people that look at life and again, they say the richer get richer. They are blessed upon blessed. While we who always go to church and while you who always pray to the Lord, you remain poor. You are not blessed. So the question I ask today is this, is God unfair? Well, in our key verse for today's message, we will see that God says it himself that his way is fair. So let us dive into this for a moment today. Let us dive into this misconception of God being unfair. Let us dive into the concept of God and fairness in our message for today. To do this, let's first define what it means to be fair. The dictionary defines being fair as to be marked by impartiality and honesty, free from self-interest, free from prejudice, free from favoritism. So by this definition, scripture would testify to the Lord being fair in his judgment and in his way and in the way that he moves. In his letter to the Romans, Paul wrote that there is no respect of persons with God. In other words, Paul was saying that there is no partiality with the Lord. There is no favoritism. No matter who you are in life, God offers to you the same opportunity that he offers to somebody else. Now, Jesus testified to the fairness of our father when he said that our father in heaven makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. So again, no matter who you are, the Lord has granted to each of us the blessing of life. Sadly, many of us, we think little of being able to see the rising of the sun. We think little of the earth being watered with rain. It seems that we do not cherish. It seems that we do not value life as we ought to do. So is God fair? Well, scripture testifies to the Lord moving without prejudice. It testifies to God offering the same opportunity to all people. Again, God says it himself here in our key verse. My way is fair. So who are we to argue? Who are we to say otherwise? Yet after hearing this, Many people will still hold to the opinion that the Lord is unfair in his judgments. They will hold to the opinion that God is unfair in his ways. This perspective, it typically comes from a heart that is filled with jealousy. It's filled with jealousy over what others have received while not taking a moment to appreciate all that God has given to them. The parable of talents, it comes to my mind when I think about this perspective of whether or not God is fair or unfair. In the 25th chapter of Matthew's gospel and in the 14th verse through the 30th verse, we find this parable, the parable of talents. And in the parable of talents, we find that a boss gave to his servants talents. 
and talents, they are a large sum of money. To one of his servants, scripture tells us that the boss gave five talents. To another servant, scripture tells us that the boss gave two talents. And to the other servant, lastly, scripture tells us that the boss gave that servant one talent. Now, each servant was to use what had been given to them by their boss. Two out of the three servants went on to use what their boss had given to them, and they increased, they profited, they gained, they added on to what they had received from their boss. However, the one servant that received only one talent that servant chose to do nothing with what they had received. I imagine that this servant, that this servant sat and that this servant watched as the other two servants profited. I imagine that this servant, while he sat and while he watched, he grumbled and he complained. He said to himself, he thought to himself that his boss did not give him the same opportunity. This servant, he likely said to himself that his boss did not give him enough to work with. The servant, he likely said and he thought that his boss was being unfair to him. Now, some will sympathize with this servant as they will say that it was unfair. That the boss gave an unequal amount to all of them. Why did they not all receive five talents is what some of us will begin to think and say. Yet I will point to the servant that only received two talents. Didn't receive the same five talents as the one servant. The servant that received two talents, he didn't sit still. This servant, he went out and he did something with what he had received. And when he did something with what he had received, he added on to what he had received. Yes, the boss gave different amounts to the servants, but in fairness, I want you to see and I want you to understand today that the boss gave whatever it was that he had to give to them. He gave all of what he had to give to the servants. So who was being unfair here? I would say today that the one that chose to not use what his boss had given to him was the one that was being unfair. The parable of talents can be likened to how the Lord pours out his gifts, how God pours out his blessings onto each of us, onto all of us. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul wrote about God pouring out his gifts and how there are diversities of gifts that are given by God. One, Paul said, receives the word of wisdom and another receives the word of knowledge. One, Paul said, receives gifts of healing while another receives the gift of prophecy. Now, is there a gift greater than another? Some of us, we may think so. See, I am able to preach and another is able to sing. But should I view my gift of teaching and my gift of preaching as being a higher, as being a better gift than the one that can stir up the soul through song? No, I shouldn't. Absolutely not. Now, the jealous and the covetous heart would certainly think otherwise, but our heart as genuine believers, we cannot think that way. We cannot be jealous of what someone else has received from God. Did you hear me there today? As Paul stated, the Lord pours out his blessings as he desires for the sole purpose of there being growth in all people. That is why God pours out his gifts as he does. Not for us to become wealthy, but so that all of us can become wealthy in our faith. So that all of us can grow and be better people. 
As genuine believers, we must understand that the Lord moves and gives as he pleases according to his will and not our own will. The Lord's will is for all people to grow and for all people to become a better people. With God's will in mind, we must understand that God is both sovereign and righteous. He is all powerful and he is perfect in his way. There is no fail in his way. We must come to understand that today. What this means for us is that God is more than fair. God isn't just fair. God is more than fair. When I say that God is more than fair, I want you to understand that God is more than fair because God is faithful to keep his way. God is faithful to keep his word. God will not fail to keep his word. God will not fail to keep his way. So again, I ask, who are we to question the Lord in his judgments? Who are we to question God's way? How can we dare say that God is not fair? How can we dare question God being fair to us today? My auntie said we can't question it. But oh, do we do it? In our key verse again today, we will see that this lack of understanding when it comes to the fairness of God, it was also an issue for the Jews. It was an issue that the Jews share with many living in our world today. We'll see in our key verse that the Jews had accused God of not being fair in his judgments. They had accused God of not being fair with the things that he was doing. Now, what was God doing that seemed unfair to the Jews? When we look at this passage of scripture here in the book of Ezekiel, here in the 18th chapter, we see that the Lord was speaking against the saying. He was speaking against a proverb that the Jews had come up with there in the second verse. Now I referenced this saying in the sermon that I preached a few months ago, but I want to reference it again here today. We'll see it say that in the second verse there in the 18th chapter of Ezekiel, the saying said that the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, which was to say that the children, they had developed a sour taste because their parents, they were eating sour grapes. In essence, the proverb that the Jews had come up with there, it spoke of this idea that the children would pay for what one's parents, what their parents had done. During the days of Jesus, you may recall that some of the disciples believed a man had been born blind because of the sins of his parents. There are some today that believe in this same concept, the concept of things being passed down through generation, like it's genetics, like it's uh, hereditary. There are some today that believe in the concept of generational sin, sin that has been passed down throughout the generations. The Lord, we will see in this passage of scripture in the 18th chapter of Ezekiel, however, he spoke against this concept. He spoke against this, this proverb that we see here today. God said that in the 20th verse, that the soul that sins, it shall be the soul that dies. We see it say that in the 21st and in the 22nd verse there, that should a wicked person turn from their sins and keep to the way of God, they, that one that turned from wickedness, that one would be forgiven. God said, forget that concept of generational sin. I ain't playing genetics here. On the other hand, they're in the 24th verse. 
we'll see that the Lord said that those that may have once been righteous, but chose to live in wickedness, God said that they would not live. So what was it that upset the Jews here? What was it that caused them to accuse God of not being fair on this matter? I believe the accusers, I believe that they looked and they saw that some were blessed who in their eyes should have not been blessed. Some who may have came from some bad parents. They may have looked at them and say, why are they more blessed than I am? Do you see that there today? These accusers, they were frustrated with God's way of grace. They were frustrated with God's way of mercy. They were frustrated with God's way of giving. They asked there in the 19th verse, why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? They were jealous. They had a jealous heart there. Oh, how dangerous it is to have a heart of jealousy. You know, this reminds me of how some of us, we get upset when we see someone walking around wearing a new outfit. Or when we see someone out behind the wheel of a brand new car. We get upset at them being blessed while believing that we ourselves are not being blessed in the same way by God. Oh, how dangerous a jealous heart is. You see, the truth of the matter is that the jealous heart, the jealous mindset is one that is foolish. It not only is one that is foolish, but it is a way that will hinder you rather than a way that will help you. You see, a jealous heart cannot be a heart, cannot be one that is blessed. Did you hear that there today? You think you're going to receive a blessing today with that heart that is a heart of jealousy? That heart that is out there coveting? Do you think that God is going to give to you when you're out there saying, why can't I have what they have? Why don't I have what they have? Do you think that God is going to bless you like they may be blessed today. Think about that for a moment. You see, you will certainly not be blessed by God living with a jealous heart that is constantly accusing God of not being fair. That is constantly accusing God of not blessing you. In our key verse, we will see that through Ezekiel, God asked the Jews is it not my way, which is fair and your ways, which are not fair? This was God saying that he is more than fair. This was God saying that he is faithful and that he keeps to his way. However, God questions there of the Jews and therefore us as well. He questions how can we charge him and being unfair when our way is not fair? That is what God questions there. I want to point out that this was not an accusation from the Lord as accusations. They can be made without necessarily having any proof. No, the Lord, he was speaking matter of factly. We see here. When he stated that the ways of the Jews and therefore again us today, when our ways are not fair. So what would lead God to making this statement? What would lead God saying that our way is not fair? Now, if we are going to accuse the Lord, who is perfect, by the way, of not being fair in his way, then we ourselves, we better be perfect in our way. 
to accuse God of not being fair is to essentially accuse God of not being faithful. We better be faithful in our way if we're going to make such an accusation against God. So we must first examine if the Lord is going against himself. We must examine if God is being unfaithful, which sounds impossible to me. And secondly, we must then examine our own faith. We must examine whether or not we are being faithful to the Lord and whether we are being faithful to ourselves. We must examine whether or not we are perfect because we're saying that God isn't being perfect. Are we perfect today? Are you perfect today? Now, we have already done some examining of God and his fairness. But when we look furthermore into scripture, we will see even more that God is more than fair. We will see that God is both faithful and that God is just. God declares his love for mankind through his actions and through his actions. We see his fairness for all of mankind. Let us consider that God created this world for us created all that is known. He created all that is unknown. He did it for all of us, for everybody. Then when mankind fell into sin in the garden, the Lord showed mankind mercy and he gave to mankind another opportunity. And again, he gave mankind another opportunity, opportunity after opportunity to continue to move about and to continue to live in this world. I would say that God was being faithful to his way by giving mankind opportunity after opportunity after opportunity seems more than fair to me. I don't know how you feel about it. Even when he desired to destroy the world, God was faithful to his way of mercy and forgiveness as he chose to again give mankind another chance. Sounds again more than fair to me. Seems that he was being faithful to mankind. That's what it sounds like to me. I don't know about you today. After this mercy, when mankind continued again to live in sin, I tell you again that the Lord remained faithful to his way. God showed his love and his fairness for mankind by giving to mankind his only begotten son, who then became our propitiation. Seems like God was being more than fair again to me. Again, we see God again, giving to all people the same opportunity to live, Mm -hmm. to live physically in this world, but not just to be able to live physically in this world, but through his only begotten son, God has given every single person living today and that lived yesterday and that will live tomorrow. He's given every last one of us the same opportunity to live on for eternity. Seems more than fair to me. I don't know how it seems to you. Some will still accuse God of not being fair. How? How is God being unfair to us today? Has the Lord gone against his way of love? Has the Lord gone against his way of grace? Assuring us mercy? Assuring us forgiveness? We know that all are forgiven and that all are shown mercy if they believe in his only begotten son. The only one who has not shown such grace is the one that blasphemes the Holy Spirit. That is the one that speaks against God, his way and his work. Should they even deserve his mercy? Should they deserve his grace if they're speaking against him? 
Is that what is unfair about the Lord? That he won't forgive the blasphemer? That he won't forgive the one who is fully convicted and living in sin? Is that what makes God unfair today? I tell you today that God is more than fair. Understand today that God is both faithful and just and that God he is willing to give of himself. He will show mercy and forgiveness to those who will come to him with their sins, who are fully convicted in their sin. And then those that go to him in prayer, God will give of himself. As we know, the Lord declared that he will bless and that he will give to us according to his will so that he may be glorified. Again, I ask today, has the Lord gone against his premise? Has he gone against his premise of being a giving God? My answer to that question will be absolutely not. From my very own personal experience, I say to you today, God has not gone against his promise of giving to me freely according to his own grace, according to his will. Christ, he declared that if we ask anything in his name, he will do it again. Unfortunately, the error that many of us run into is that we fall incredibly short in recognizing God's giving. We fall short in recognizing God's blessings. As I said earlier, many of us, we don't view being able to see the light of another day as a blessing. It also seems that many of us don't view being able to see our loved ones, being able to see each other again and again as another blessing. It is a blessing to see the light of another day to see each other once again, yet we take it for granted. It is not until we suffer some form of loss that we realize just how blessed we are. Why must it come to that? At the very same time, while many of us are grumbling about the new clothes others are wearing, it seems that some of us, we may forget that we probably just brought some new clothes ourselves and we don't need any. Well, many of us are grumbling about the new car someone may be driving. It seems that some of us, we forget that our car is actually still running and we aren't having any problems with it. Whereas that person that went out and brought a new car, they may have actually needed that new car. Their old car, it may have stopped running as good as our car runs. Yet we say that God is unfair in his way, in his judgments, in how he supplies our every need. Let me tell you something today. You may have your wants, but God will supply your every need. He's not concerned about your wants. He's concerned about what you require. Understand that today. God will supply your every need. God supplies our every need so that we do not have to worry about what we will eat, what we will drink, so that we don't have to worry about what we will wear. Yet some of us are too carried away with our wants to add to our riches rather than to understand how great a blessing it is for the Lord to be there taking care of us, guiding us as we go along the way, shielding and protecting us, supplying our every need. The blame, I tell you today, it is on us. It is on us for not recognizing how good God is to us. The blame is on us for not recognizing all that the Lord does for us all that he has done for us. The blame I tell you today, it falls at our feet for not recognizing how God is more than fair to us. It falls more at our feet than it ever will fall at the feet of God. 
How can we say that God is not fair when God is more than fair, when God is faithful, when God is just, when he again is guiding us, when he is shielding, when he is protecting us, when he is supplying our every need, how can we dare say that God is being unfair to us today? God is faithful and just. He keeps his word. He keeps his way. In the book of Malachi, the Lord, he had a question for the Jews. And this same question can be asked of all of us mankind today. In the third chapter of Malachi and in the eighth verse, you will see the question. You'll see that God asked, will a man rob God? I used to hear that question when I was little and I would wonder how could it be possible for a man to rob God? I suppose back then I didn't know any better. I didn't know that it was possible for a man to rob God. You see, the truth of the matter is that we rob God in several ways all of which can be summed up to the fact that we aren't nearly as faithful as he is to us. In that same verse from Malachi there, the third chapter and the eighth verse, the Lord said there of the Jews that they robbed him in tithes and in offerings. Now, before someone goes thinking that old pastor's about to start begging for money, here he goes. Let me explain here to you what the Lord meant there by bringing up tithes and offerings there. We should understand that tithes, they were voluntarily given in order to help with the upkeep of the tabernacle during the uh, years that Israel wandered through the wilderness. And when the temple came around, tithes were given for the upkeep of the temple. Not only were the tithes given to help with the upkeep of those structures, they were also given for the care of the Levites and the priests that served in the tabernacle or that served daily in the temple. Not only were tithes given for those two purposes, tithes, they were voluntarily given to help care for those who were less fortunate to care for those who are in need, to care for the poor. The idea behind the giving of tithes was that God gave to the people liberally and the people should in return be willing to give just a tenth to help with the upkeep and to help with the uplifting of those that were around them. So what I want you to understand here today, that when God asked that question and made that statement following up with that question, God was essentially saying that the Jews had robbed God of their service to him. Did you hear that? The Jews, they were robbing God and they're serving the Lord. You see, the Jews, they had stopped having faith in God. They stopped worshiping the Lord and they stopped helping one another. Do we rob God today? Do we rob God today in our service to him? Let us again remember the great commandments that Christ spoke of in Matthew's gospel. The first and great commandment Jesus said was to love the Lord, our God, with our whole heart. And the second Jesus said was like it to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And I will again ask today, are we faithfully loving the Lord with our whole heart today? To answer that question we must be able to answer whether or not we are faithfully looking after and whether we are helping each other. You see, we are robbing God today if we are not acting out of faith in him. If we are not taking care of 
if we are not helping, if we are not uplifting one another, we are robbing God in our faith and in our service to him. Is this our idea of being fair to God? Robbing him of our service? Robbing him of our faith? Is this our idea of being fair to him? God there in that third chapter of Malachi and in the 13th verse, we'll see that he then pointed out that the Jews, they would speak harshly against him. At that time, the Jews, they would say to one another that it was useless to serve the Lord. Imagine saying that, but they're wanting something from God in return, saying that God is useless. They would then even ask, we will see there in the 14th verse, what profit is it that we have kept God's ordinance? Imagine thinking that is useless or no profit to serve the Lord when all he does is bless you. Yeah. Many of us, we think the same way today. Is this our idea of being fair? Thinking that it is useless. It is useless for us to serve the Lord. Many of us, we ask, why should we even pray to the Lord? We ask, we wonder, why should we have faith in God? Some of us, we, we conclude in our thoughts that, again, it is useless. It is pointless. We conclude and we was ask, what good comes from believing in the Lord? Yet all God does is pour out his love unto this world. All God does is continue to bless us as we go along the way. Is this our idea of being fair to question and to then accuse the Lord of being unfair when God absolutely is more than fair? Continuing to bless us. Another day comes and another day goes. God gives us another day. He gives us another opportunity. God is more than fair. He is faithful. He is just. Our failure to uphold our end of being faithful, I tell you today, that is what is unfair. As believers, we must do a better job in upholding our end of this fellowship, our relationship with the Lord. We must do a better job on our end because God is being more than fair. But again, is our way being fair? Are we being fair to the Lord? We desire that the Lord continually give and give and give. Yet what do we do? What do we do? We just want to take and take and take. We will give little to nothing of ourselves in return to the Lord. We are no different than that one servant that received one talent from his boss. God gives and we do nothing with what he gives. We keep it to ourselves and we don't share it with those that are around us. And imagine that we say that God is the one that is being unfair. The Lord, he desires something from us. Someone will ask, well, what does God desire from me? All that the Lord desires from us is for us to be faithful to him. This is what is fair. God desires for us to love him with our whole heart. God desires for us to put him and his way first. This is what is fair. I encourage you today to be a faith and to put the Lord first 
because God is doing the same thing for you. You see, this is what is fair. We desire that the Lord again, continually give and give and give of himself. But will you properly use what God has given to you today? Will you give of yourself to those that are around you or will you hold it? Will you keep it to yourself? I encourage you today to do right by the Lord by properly using what God has given to you. This is what is fair. We must be willing to lift a finger. We must be willing to put our faith to work. We must be willing to put our faith in action. It is not enough for us to say, I believe. It is not enough for us to say, I have faith. If you have faith, then you will treat God right. You will treat him fairly. You will actually act on that faith that you say you have. I believe that sometimes we have not received because sometimes we're actually not putting our faith into action. Did you hear that? Why should we receive anything from God if we are not going to properly use what he has given to us? We who are genuine of faith, we must learn how to be more than fair. We must learn to be genuine to our calling. We must learn how to be genuine to our faith. If we desire for the Lord to be more than fair to us, if we desire for God to be faithful to us, we must learn to be fair to him. We must learn to be more than fair to him. We must learn to be faithful to him. We must learn to be faithful to his word. We must learn to be faithful to his way. Amen. Amen. Amen.